Uh, I feel awkward being here today. Actually, I, I normally speak very happily to groups, but I reala realize from the last session how much more Americans have had to think about the uh, ethnicity issues around inequality. And my approach to the whole issue uh, starts off from somewhere very different. Um, I think really to understand how inequalities work and what they do to us, you actually have to think about animal dominance hierarchies and what they're about, and then start seeing how that interacts with all sorts of other issues like uh, um, gender and ethnicity and educational things and so on. Um, I, I sometimes say to people, I think uh, it's more about monkeys than about marks. Um, I'm going to, I guess quite a few of you know um, our work in the Spirit Level book, but I'm going to take you through a bit of that. Uh, because I think you have to show people the data before they'll start realizing there's something to be understood behind it. Um, so, uh, I actually like to start with this picture because it shows how miserable we all are. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is people in the prime of life going to, the, going to work in the morning in the centre of London. Every face there is depressed, haggard, anxious. Um, some of them, she looks as if she's about to have a nervous breakdown. And even the ones talking to their friends on the phone. Are, mm. And I, I do think what I have to say has some relevance to the fact that I think our societies are, are pretty inefficient ways of producing well-being. Um, and of course, in terms of environmental issues, we want to move towards sustainable well-being. What we need to grow is not the economy, um, or at least uh, only if that serves sustainable well-being. We want to grow well-being. Um, I... I'm in two minds. I still haven't made up my mind at this late stage whether to read. I'm, yeah, I'm going to read this to you. People look at the effects of poverty and inequality and they think, you know, it's the, it's the poor diets or it's the bad housing or it's the air pollution or whatever. Um, or they think it's poor people behave in silly ways, you know, these sorts of ideas. Sometimes it's an idea that the, the vulnerable move to the bottom and the resilient move up. I want to concentrate on the effects of low social status itself. And one way of illustrating that is to, a quote from a study in the Journal of Social Policy uh, which uh, came, the study was um, an international team interviewed people regarded as poor in very different uh, contexts. So in Uganda, in India, in China, Pakistan, Korea, the United Kingdom and Norway. And in some of those societies, poverty means living in a tin shack with an earth floor uh, having no cooking facilities inside, uh, no sanitation and so on. In others, like Norway, it lives, means leave it, living in a three-bedroom house with central heating and a flat-screen television. So, totally different material standards. But the experience of poverty this team uh, brought out is astonishingly the same. I'm going to just read that to you. Respondents universally despised poverty and frequently despised themselves for being poor. Parents were often despised by their ch children, women despised their menfolk, and some men were reported to take out their self-loathing on their partners and children, despite respondents generally believing that they had done their best against all odds. They mostly considered that they had both failed themselves by being poor and that others saw them as failures. This internalization of shame was further externally reinforced in the family, the workplace, and in their dealings with officialdom. Even children couldn't escape this shaming, for with the possible exception of Pakistan, school was an engine of social grading, a place of humiliation for those without the possessions that guaranteed social acceptance. No parent was able to escape the shame of failing to provide for their children 
even when children were prepared to stop asking for things, the latter itself being a further source of shame. For men, relying on others or on welfare benefits was perceived as a challenge uh, to their sense of masculinity. A British father uh, to two children admitted that he felt like shit. I'm the man in this relationship. I'm meant to be the man to take care of the missus and my kids, and I don't. Now, all that is psychosocial fact stuff about low social status, felt by people at those in those very different material circumstances from one society to another. I'm going to show you evidence of those same things working in terms of data. This is the relationship between life expectancy and uh, gross domestic product per capita. So rapid rises in life expectancy in the early stages of economic growth and then it levels out. Um, and so in the rich developed countries, uh, it makes no difference whether you're there or there. Life expectancy goes on increasing in the rich world. You know, every 10 years past, we get another two or three years life expectancy. It's not a ceiling effect, but those ra increases in life expectancy we get unrelated to economic growth. Um, Angus Deaton in a study says even if you look at changes over 10, 20 or 40 years, you find precious little relationship between economic growth in the rich countries and changes in life expectancy. And that's really important because uh, what it basically is telling us is that in the rich world we've got to the end of the real benefits that have transformed the quality of human life. These people who haven't got basic necessities do need higher material standards, but for us to have more and more of everything makes less and less difference. But look, I, sorry, I'm just going to take those countries and blow them up a bit so you can see them. These are going to, going to the countries I'm going to be talking about. Life expectancy again, gross national income per head. USA and Norway, twice as rich as those, and it doesn't make a blind bit of difference to life expectancy. But within each of these countries, there are these incredible social gradients in health. These are standardized mortality ratios. These are uh, deciles of income. This thing's falling to bits. Um, sorry, quartiles. Um, no, the, the, each is 20%. So you've got the richest 20%, the next quartile, and the next, and the poorest 20% with the highest death rates. This is US data. Um, and it, it, it's, uh, you know, these are astonishing differences um, and uh, the same for measures of ill health amongst kids it slopes a different way because this time the, uh, the, the poorest the lowest educated at this end rather than this there. Um, in Britain some old data but it's basically the, exactly the same pattern life expectancy richest neighborhoods poorest neighborhoods and you see it's a gradient right across society it's no good understanding health inequalities by talking about the homeless, um, the unemployed, and so on. They make a small contribution to this end. But they don't, it doesn't explain why these people are uh, less healthy than those. You've got to have a quite different way of looking at this to understand it. Um, and it's a paradox that income doesn't make any difference between our societies anymore. And yet within them, it seems crucial and the explanation is that within our societies, we're looking at differences in social status, where we are in relation to others. We're looking at the effects of relative income, social position. And so just as that quote I read, showing you that it's not the actual material standards that was behind that common experience in those different countries, um, this too is telling you the same thing. The differences of position in the society is so fundamentally important. Remember, I'm not saying that there aren't material problems. There is such a thing as absolute poverty, even in our developed countries. Um, but if we're trying to account for the majority of the population and what's going on there, it doesn't, uh, doesn't do. As soon as you've got that idea that an important part of the picture is relativities, 
then what happens if you make the differences between us bigger or smaller? And that's really what I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to gallop through this because I think many of you will know it from our reading our work. Uh, the measure we took, just because it's easy for people to understand, is how much richer the top 20% than the bottom 20% in each society. And in Japan, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, the top 20% are getting three and a half or four times as much as the bottom 20%. But in these countries, Australia, UK, Portugal, USA, Singapore, the gap is twice as big. By the way, I'm going to show you a lot of figures. They all come from international sources. So this is uh, um, the UN Human Development Report. We just download them. We don't uh, struggle to decide what data is comparable with what. We just get what WHO has on death rates or OECD has on some outcome. Uh, so, if people don't like the statistics, don't blame us. Um, so, you know, they're all rich market democracies, but this is an extraordinary difference. Some are twice as unequal as others. So, what does it do? Basically, I'm going to show you this graph again and again. I found this on Google Images, and I thought, somebody understood! <laughs> uh, you know, I did, I promise you, I did not make this graph. <laughs> um, uh, but um, <clears throat> it, it, I'm going to show you this with different thing, different problems up the side. Um, the first one I'm going to show you is an index combining all these things for, for different countries. So you've got scores for proportion of the population in prison, the homicide rates, the obesity rates, social mobility. Uh, we put them all into one index, and here it is in relation to those rainbow stripes of inequality I've just shown you. So, um, at the most unequal end, USA, Portugal, UK, uh, all doing badly on those. Um, and uh, down here, the more equal countries, all doing much better. We thought, because we were writing in about 2007, we thought, when nobody talked about inequality at all, we thought we're going to get really punished when this comes out. People will be finding, looking every which way to unpick it. So we thought, well, people will think we've just selected these to suit our argument. So we looked at the UNICEF Index of Child Wellbeing. It, uh, it was compiled by other people, nothing to do with us at all. UNICEF Index, it's made to measure child well-being in rich countries. Um, it contains about 40 components, so whether kids have books at home, what immunization rates are like, whether there's bullying in schools, what their maths and literacy sc talk scores are like, whether they can talk to their parents, all that goes into it. Um, and here you see um, <coughs> lower levels of child well-being in the more unequal countries. Um, exactly the same. Uh, no, sorry, this... This is not the, the first lot of UNICEF um, uh, data we looked at. Um, this is a, s a second lot, 10 years later, in pediatrics, the journal Pediatrics. We looked at change uh, over that 10-year period. And interestingly, there's, again, a significant relationship between changes in inequality and changes in child well-being. For instance, Sweden's been getting much more unequal than it used to be. Um, and what's happened to its child well-being is exactly what we'd predict um, on the basis of these relationships. So, that's, if you like, adult and child well-being, different measures, different indexes, showing just the same pattern. Uh, quickly through a few more uh, other people's work. This is um, death rates of um, men in, of working age in American states and Canadian provinces. Um, the measure of inequality here works the other way round. So it's the share of income get, going to the poorest half of the population. So this is the more equal end. This is the only one where the more equal countries are this side or states. Um, but the scale of the differences in mortality is really impressive. Um, dropping out of high school, huge differences. You go from about what's that? Um, 12% there, up to 25% um, in American states. This is uh, uh, teenage birth rates. Um, what have you got there? That would be five 
births per thousand women in their teens. In the UK, we've got six times that level, and you have higher still. So we're not talking about small differences. Um, this is imprisonment. Um, <coughs> And uh, this is a log scale, so it, uh, you know, if it wasn't the curve, it would curve up like that, but it's harder to judge the intervening points, but 40 prisoners per 100,000 population would be there, and 400, 10 times as much is, is there. Uh, that relationship isn't mainly due to more crime. Most of it is due to more punitive sentencing in more unequal societies, and we looked at the states in the United States which do and don't retain the death penalty and there's a significant tendency for it to be the more unequal states which retain the death penalty. And prison can, I mean if you've got to go to prison anywhere, go in one of the more e equal countries, you'll get some remedial help and so on, uh, whereas you'll be brutalized in uh, some of the more unequal ones. Um, mental illness, um, this isn't people coming in for medical care because that would be too influenced by how you access medical care. It's uh, uh, diagnostic interviews to random samples of the population and it, what have you got, um, about 7 or 8 percent of the population had any mental illness in the year preceding the survey um, and it goes up to sort of three times that level. Uh, mainly anxiety disorders and depression and so on, but uh, huge differences. Um, uh, in the last session, something about uh, social mobility and uh, equal opportunities came up. Um, well, sorry, income inequality, inequalities of outcome and inequalities of opportunity. This is um, a measure of social mobility. Uh, basically, it's a relationship between father's and son's incomes. It's uh, taken the father's income when a son is born and the son's income 30 years later. Um, and so, uh, I'm sorry it's not mothers and daughters as well, but, but that, that would be harder because women's economic activity rates have changed so much. This depends on the big cohort studies of samples of the population in different countries. So it's really asking, do rich fathers have rich sons and poor fathers have poor sons? And uh, that is much truer in the more unequal countries. United States is here, um, Denmark up there. Um, uh, Kate, who's better at jokes than me, my, my, now my wife, uh, says that if you Americans want to live the American dream, you better go to Denmark. <laughs> Uh, but l look, the, the evidence is, and I think we were the first to show this relationship on a much smaller uh, sample of countries, uh, but it's now been shown on, on several different data sets, um, I think is, is quite reliable. All it means is that uh, richer parents have ways of passing on their privileges, uh, not only very overt ones, but all sorts of other little subtle ways. So you know, um, children of richer parents are sort of recognized in uh, lots of subtle and mysterious ways. Um, I want to say that I'm not talking about something that's quite different from class and status. It seems to me I'm talking about whether societies have a very steep social pyramid like that, or a much shallower one of that kind. Um, and when I say we're not talking about anything, uh, it's, income inequality isn't a new thing. It's telling us more about the relationships with class and status we've always known about. Everyone knows that violence is worse in every society in the poorest areas. Um, educational performance of school kids is worse there. Um, you know, all those, all those problems accumulate. Um, what people often think, you know, how is it that these totally different problems are all related to one thing, income inequality? It's just too implausible. You know, the determinants of health and determinants of education and of imprisonment of whatever it is, uh, they're all too different. They're all problems that have social gradients. Um, you know, although there's ill health and mental illness and drug abuse at the top of society, they're all more common at the bottom. 
Um, and it's those problems with social gradients that become worse in more unequal societies. And so in a way we're saying something very simple. Problems that we know are related to social status in our societies get worse when you increase the social status differences. It's as simple as that. Um, oh, what have I done? Got it back in. Yeah, there's one surprise though. You might think from what I said that um, what inequality does is just damage the poor. You know, I, I often start off by saying to people, there's a naive view of poverty, which is just that it, poverty only matters if it creates, uh, sorry, more, there's a naive view of inequality, that is that it only matters if it creates poverty or people think it's very unfair. But actually a more accurate view is to recognize that inequality increases social distances between us, feelings of superiority and inferiority, ideas that some people are better, brighter, more capable, and others are stupid and lazy. All those kinds of prejudices, uh, people's ideas of themselves, you know, the rich used to, well, still do, regard themselves almost as a different, a superior race. Um, they live different lives, they think they've got to where they are because they're brilliant um, and they probably have a, an idea of uh, intelligence differences as being uh, almost wholly genetic and so on. They're just born with it and others haven't got what it takes. Uh, but um, there's now a lot of evidence showing that we're all affected by inequality. It's not just something that happens to the poor. So, for instance, this is uh, kids' literacy scores um, in relation to, classified by how many years education parents have had. So, up here you've got uh, kids of well-educated parents. The parents have had 13, 14, 15 or 16 years of education. Down here you've got kids of parents who've had four, five, six, seven years education. And what you see is that in the more equal countries, the social gradient is flatter. The differences are biggest down at the bottom, but even at the top, it looks as if there's a little advantage of being in a more equal country. We know of a lot of research papers looking at different outcomes, which have this broadly similar pattern. Ichiro Kuachi and colleagues at the Harvard School of Public Health, in one of their papers using multi-level models, they said, that uh, the effects of inequality go so far up the social hierarchy that they called inequality a general social pollutant. You know, it isn't just the poor, it damages all of us. Um, and note also that this isn't saying that there are more people um, with poorly educated parents in the United States or it's not telling you about the distribution of the population, it's saying wherever you are, you do less well in a more um, unequal society. This is a comparison uh, published in JAMA by Banks and Marmot. Um, it looks at different uh, diseases, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, lung disease, heart disease. People are classified by uh, thirds, tertiles of education, so the best educated are the right-hand columns in each of these sets, the poorest educated, the left-hand columns. Um, the bars behind uh, USA, the ones in front, the light blue, are England and Wales. And if this is anything to do with when that study was, when its data was uh, put together, Britain was a more equal society, um, then it's suggesting, again, that the advantages of e e greater equality go right across society. It's not just the poorly educated. Um, and they talked to, in another paper of the, uh, the social gradients being uh, steeper in the United States. Um, we act, no, I, I won't uh, spend time on that. This is another example, exactly the same thing. It's when we were first wondering whether health inequalities were the same in every country and or whether they varied, um, some Swedish researchers reclassified their infant deaths according to the British Registrar General's 
occupational class classification. Uh, and so these bars are infant mortality. Uh, it's anachronistically, it's a classification by father's occupation. At least it was when this was done. So single parents have to go on their own. Then you have unskilled manual workers, semi-skilled manual, skilled manual, uh, junior non-manual, that's clerical people, and intermediate non-manual, teachers, nurses, people like that. And uh, these are the professions, doctors, lawyers, directors of larger companies. And again, you see that Sweden has uh, lower death rates, infant death rates, right across. The big difference is the biggest at the bottom of society. But even at the top, there seems to be a small benefit of being in more equal Sweden. And that seems to be the general pattern. Um, if you've got to generalize about the effects of inequality, it affects the biggest, lower down in society. Uh, it's not talking about the super rich. We don't have, the, you know, the fraction of 1% of the population. We don't know what the rates of depression or ill health or violence are. Um, but it's talking about 90 or 95 percent of the population doing better in a more equal society. I want now to try and encapsulate the, and all the things I've been showing you, they're all behavioral factors. They're all things that show that something's happening in people's minds. It, their behavior is different in more unequal societies. It's not that's that you don't live in quite such a nice house or have such a nice car. It's something much more fundamental than that. Um, and, what it, and, and you can see it most clearly in, in social relations. Um, this is a measure of trust. It's the proportion of the population who, who agree that most people can be trusted. And it goes from about what we've got there, about 10 or 15 percent of the population who feel they can trust others, um, to in the more equal countries, 60 or 65 percent of the population who feel they can trust others. Um, Huge difference. If you've got to walk home late at night in a big city, you'd be much, feel much better about it in one of these countries. This is the same uh, graph, basically, from the American states using things from the, the General Social Survey on trust. Uh, very similar distribution. Um, this is violence, homicide rates. Uh, oh, I should have said, and this reminds me, some people have persisted in saying it's not inequality, it's race or ethnicity. Um, the graph I showed you comparing um, illness rates in England and Wales is conf uh, with ones in, in the United States is confined to whites, particularly because they didn't want people to say it's something to do with ethnic mix. So it was tertiles of education of whites and illness amongst whites. This uh, extraordinary graph of homicide in American states and Canadian provinces, um, a tenfold difference, you know, you've got 15 homicides per million people there going up to 150. Um, again, people said, well, it's, it's actually it's an uh, ethnic, ethnic mix in different states. And so these people, Daly and Wilson, two Canadians, um, they looked at homicide rates to answer that point. They looked at homicide rates with white perpetrators and inequality amongst white populations alone. And the graph looks almost the same. Makes very little difference. Um, and of, indeed, these relationships, this is one of the best researched relationships in, in this stuff. There are about 60 studies around the world looking at differences in uh, um, violence, measures of violence against uh, um, inequality. Um, and interestingly, it's not about gun control either. <coughs> not having gun control makes things a bit worse. But actually, if you control this relationship for gun ownership, you find the relationships a little bit closer. At least, sorry, that was true of our, our international study. We didn't try and do it for the American states. Um, but look, there are studies. I've shown you that trust levels are higher in more equal societies. 
and in more equal American states. There's now quite a bit of work on that. Measures of social cohesion, involvement in, social, in community life, social capital, um, belonging to civic associations, the Putnam type measures of social capital, all stronger and more equal societies. There are now studies which show that people in more equal societies um, are more willing to help each other. Um, questionnaires about their willingness to help uh, uh, neighbours or old people or disabled or whatever, um, greater willingness to in more equal societies. So you move from closer community, more closely knit communities with a good deal of reciprocity, people to some extent caring for each other, to that breakdown of trust, to increases in violence, and then um, we've li recently given lectures in uh, Mexico and South Africa, uh, where of course there are much higher inequalities than there are here in the United States. And you see people barricading themselves against each other. Endless houses have these fences round them, uh, bars on the window, razor wire. I now regard razor wire as a symbol of inequality. Um, in South Africa, I'm sorry that's such a bad photograph, um, those threads you might be able to see across the top, horizontal ones, are electric fences. And uh, this notice says armed response. If you're seen climbing in, you might get shot. And some big dogs, again, you can't see very well. So you move from a society where there is some willing to help each other, where there is strong community life, where people mostly trust each other, to societies where you defend yourselves against other people. And then the last part of that picture, this is from... Uh, Bowles and Jayadev, it's actually a graph they produced for the, an article in the New York Times. Um, it's the proportion of the population in each country in what they call guard labor, security staff, prison officers, police, people like that. And the more inequality you have, it looks as if the proportion of people doing this guard labor increased. More labor is used in defending ourselves against each other. And they show that as the United States inequality has increased, uh, so has the proportion of guard labor. So it's a pretty coherent picture you get of the effect of inequality on, you know, you become more out for yourself in more unequal societies. Now think, well, uh, no, I, I should keep to my original plan. All these are just little bivariate relationships, not controlling for anything. But there is there are probably three or four hundred papers in the journals on these issues, particularly around health and violence. So there are multi-level studies of uh, cohorts as they age over time, effects of inequality. People have controlled for lots of things. We also know something about uh, time lags now. Um, <coughs> Uh, and uh, so, um, don't think that because I'm showing you very simple stuff, I mean, basically we did that in our book because so much work is in the academic journals which never gets into the public arena at all. Our book doesn't really say anything new at all. It says it to people in a way they can begin to read it. You know, as academics, we have to be able to get the stuff out there into the public arena. Otherwise, it's stillborn. Um, but look, while studying the determinants of health inequalities, people, researchers around the world, it, one of the big surprises was how important psychosocial factors were, working through the biology of chronic stress. And the big categories of chronic stress, if you like, are low social status, rather well, as in that quote I first read you, weak social connections, not being involved in community, not having good relationships, friendships and so on, being socially, more socially isolated, having fewer social ties, very damaging for health. 
Um, and not only in studies where you try and observational studies where you try and control out the influence of education and income differences and so on, but even in studies, experimental studies, where they get volunteers in and they make little puncture wounds on the people's arms and measure how quickly they heal. They heal more slowly if you have a bad relationship with your partner. Or giving people nasal drops with gold, cold viruses in. You sniff them up and then they see what proportion of you develop colds from that same measured exposure. If you have fewer friends, you're three or four times as likely to develop a cold. We now know quite a bit about how chronic stress affects the immune system and the cardiovascular system and many other processes essential for health. Um, but also stress in early life, which we now know casts a long shadow forwards. So, you know, my cortisol levels um, are likely, to, well, in people my age, they are related to birth weight and so on. There are these long-term processes. But they're not telling us about quite separate things. They're telling us about one common factor. If you like, the insecurities and anxieties, the feeling of not being valued that go with low social status, look, being looked down on, also stress in early life. The anxieties, the insecurities, uh, those feelings of not being valued. And friendship fits into it because, you know, if you don't have friends, if you feel people avoid you, if they don't invite you to things, don't sit, you, you, you sit next to you, we all immediately have those self-doubts. Maybe I'm unattractive, boring, they think I'm stupid, all that kind of stuff. And although there are more, more powerful sources of chronic stress, losing, losing your job or your housing or being in prison, much worse sources of stress, but most of the population don't have those. You in prison, I think, about 1% of your population. Um, but uh, we all know these anxieties about whether one's valued and appreciated, uh, regarded as unattractive, you know. All those social anxieties, those social evaluation anxieties. Uh, so that's what I think is, is one of the keys in this picture. And indeed, in the public health, in the social epidemiology, um, the, uh, um, there's this sort of Jekyll and Hyde relationship. Social status differences and low social status keep on coming up as damaging to health. Things to do with friendship, always the opposite, protective. Um, and of course there are the two opposite ways in which human beings can come together. And think of this in terms of the sort of really basic evolutionary relationships. You know, as, as Hobbes said, um, because we have the same needs, we can fight each other for everything. You can be my rivals for food, for jobs, for shelter, whatever it is. And if you look at Sapolsky and his baboons in the wild, he talks about how, you know, a subordinate that's found a nice bit of shade of a tree. A dominant will come up and push him out. Um, whatever it is, um, you know, the, the subordinates give way to the dominants. Um, and so these are the two basic ways in which you can come together. Either the strongest get it, or they recognize each other and there's some kind of, of sharing, um, a recognition of each other's needs. Um, yeah, I think before, mm -hmm. this is a slight interruption, so I hope I'll pick up that thread. Um, the dominant baboon or macaque or whatever is always the, the strongest and the weakest at the bottom. <laughs> if there's any uncertainty about the order in the hierarchy, there's some kind of trial of strength. These dominant hierarchies <coughs> are basically bullying hierarchies. I wish I could find internationally comparable measures of bullying amongst adults. Um, I haven't found any, but there are a number of um, measures uh, in children. This is uh, um, one available for more countries than we had when we did our book. We showed the relationship. 
amongst a small number of countries with different measures of bullying, um, conflict between kids, but uh, this is the percent of 11-year-olds who bullied others two or more times in the preceding month. And uh, you see, you've got about, well, that would be, well, down there would be about 2%. And up there you've got 20%. So you're getting a tenfold difference in these sort of outcomes. Um, we always used to think that our job in epidemiology, trying to find the uh, causes of the huge class differences in death rates, was to find which material factor was it the damp housing, was it the poorer diet, was it the air pollution that uh, led to more of which disease or what. We always thought that our measures of class were just a proxy for the things that really matter that lay underneath that. But through people start studying animals in, in both in captivity and the wild, where we saw that even when you manipulate social status, where you keep animals in the same material conditions and give them the same diet, that quite often you get the same gradient in stress hormones, for instance, as is seen amongst human beings. So this is Carol Shively pointing out uh, the furred up arteries of the subordinate animal and the dominant one that's still clear. Um, Robert Sapolsky, who studies the baboons in the wild, you know, he's a, a, a neuroendocrinologist at Stanford. Uh, I just think it's a lovely picture because he's made himself look so like a baboon. Um, he's a wonderful person. But, um, uh, you know, it was when they started showing some of the similarities uh, in animal dominance hierarchies, we suddenly realized it's status itself which is doing an important part of the damage. Yeah, so to continue the story I was uh, touching on earlier, we can either fight each other for everything or we can recognize each other's needs. And um, words like companion, they show that there's recognition of that. that your friends or companions are the people you share with, you share food. Um, and necessities. Um, and of course, even in the religious symbolism of the communion, it's about sharing food. We still eat together. Um, and of course, you don't give your friends who come to dinner a half portion of everything while you heap a great pile on it. You know that friendship depends on equality. Um, and this wonderful anthropologist, um, Marshall Stalin, says he, he studied hunting and gathering societies, which are, were remarkably egalitarian, um, based on food sharing and gift exchange. And he says gifts make friends, and friends make gifts. You know, the most concrete way in which I can show you I'm not going to fight you for access is make the gift. And your sense of indebtedness that maybe means you reciprocate, he says, is the basic social bond. And if you know David Graeber's book on uh, debt, where he's talking about that sense of indebtedness, uh, about the history of debt, um, and its importance in human relationships, uh, it's really extraordinary stuff. Um, but look, the kind of stresses we are most sensitive to, we now know quite a bit about that because of our endless experiments getting volunteers to do stressful tasks and measuring their cortisol levels. You can measure it in saliva or blood. Uh, so you know, you know if they're going to do this task, what's, how their cortisol levels are responding. But in this meta-analysis of 208 experimental studies like that done around the world, they start looking to see what kind of tasks, many different tasks we're using these different experiments, most reliably push up people's stress hormones. And they say it's tasks that include social evaluative threat. In the paper they say threats to self-esteem or social status, where others can negatively judge your performance. And of course, that's why people find this public speaking is stressful. We don't want to make a fool of ourselves in front of other people. Um, 
And you see immediately how that relates to social status. You admire and look up to, or you look down on, um, and regard it as inferior in, in all sorts of ways. And of course, the power of all this stuff is that it's very difficult for us not to regard social position or wealth as an indicator of ability. And we've done that endlessly. I mean, there was some reference to the origins of slavery earlier. And of course, Europeans, you know, these people have such basic technology compared to us. Must be a reflection of their inferior mental ability. Um, and we do that all the time in our societies. Um, whether you think somebody is capable and worth something or whether you think they're not. Um, and it's very hard to get away from that. You can't sort of easily get right, you can't tell everyone, look, drop this nonsense, and treat everyone the same despite the inequalities. We won't do it. You have to reduce the inequalities uh, because of those tendencies are so strong. Now, I said that um, inequality produces more, I think I said more status anxiety. Um, this study shows, uh, it's, it's, I think, 27, 30, something like that, European countries, um, and it's measuring status anxiety. and in the more unequal societies, the higher levels of status anxiety right across all income groups. So this is the poorest decile of the population going through up to the highest decile. So the poorest have higher levels of status anxiety, but more unequal countries have higher levels of status anxiety than uh, low poverty countries. So even the better off are still feeling more worried about status. Um, there are two responses. You can either be overcome with a sense of low, low self-esteem, self-doubts, feelings of incompetence, fears about your abilities, your inadequacies, um, depression, social contact becomes an ordeal. You start to withdraw from social life. You know, we all have a, a bit of it. Lots of people feel they can only really relax when they're at home alone. Because when you meet other people, you have to put on a good face, social performance. Um, you know, you might get an invitation to go out in the evening and say, oh, Christ, I don't know whether I could face it tonight. Um, and, and social contact actually ceasing to be the, the main pleasure in human life, the driver in studies of happiness and health, of what is so essential to the quality of life. It starts to be, you know, an ordeal. Um, but the other response to feeling worried about how you're seen and judged, you know, some people are so important and other people are worthless, so they're living with me, uh, is to go in for the <coughs> process that they call self-enhancement, self-advertisement, self-aggrandizement, narcissism. You find ways of bringing into the conversation that you, uh, you went to a very good university, you got one of the best results, you were promoted rather young. My family and I are doing rather well, so we can have, we, we on our holiday, well, it's something, an incident that happened at um, Apple, the other side of the world, where we go for our holidays, you know. You often get dinner parties where there's strings of little stories people tell, and there's a certain text. People are saying something about their success, their achievements, and just letting you know a little bit. Um, this measure of self enhancement was based on getting people to say how they compared with the, what they thought was the average in their society. So, do you think you're cleverer than other people in the United States? Do you think you're more attractive? Do you think you're more generous? And so they ask people questions of that kind, and in more unequal countries, people go into this self-enhancement. It's a bit like, you probably know the joke, that 90% of the population think they're better drivers than the average. Um, it's that process. Um, but I, I, I must uh, 
um, open speculative consumption goes up because it's how we show what we're worth, you know, uh, to each other. Uh, debt goes up because if you're going to look good, you must have to spend more. So debt follows inequality. Um, but look, this is what's happened to inequality. Here's 1970 in the USA. Uh, this is the Gini coefficient, the most common measure of inequality. It's just risen continuously. But if you look at the whole of the 20th century, well, actually, this is from 1930 to 2015, each country has had this same basic pattern, high inequalities until the uh, 1930s when they've come down. They've gone on coming down until uh, around 1980, and then there's the modern rise of inequality. That is basically the rise and fall of the labor movement. Uh, not simply because trade unions do wonderful things for the wages of their members, but because it's a sort of an indication of the strength of the whole countervailing ideology. And once that had gone, neoliberalism takes over. Uh, so, for instance, if there's a slightly different measure of inequality, these people, uh, Colin Gordon, um, used uh, the share of income going to the top 10%, that's the red line at the top in, in the USA, this is 1918, so it comes plunging down and then the modern rise of inequality, and this is the proportion of the population in trade unions. Um, as I said, don't think it means simply that trade unions do wonderful things for the wages of their members. Take it as an indication of the sort of countervailing, the strength of the countervailing ideology in society. Um, we've both got more unequal because the rich have run away from the rest of us. This is a, a graph of um, the, all these, nearly all these, I've been showing you a pinch from other people, but I have at least credited them. Um, the top 350 US companies, it's the, how much bigger is the CEO's income than the average production worker? And you see in, here's 1975, 1980, uh, the CEOs were getting about, uh, what, 30 or 40 percent more than the average production worker. But then, sometime around 1980, it really took off, and now they're getting hundreds of times more. Um, and it's not related to performance. As I, I found this uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was very pleased to find that I found it before The Economist. The Economist prints printed it in this week's uh, um, issue, but what it is, is uh, they take the, the biggest uh, 429 publicly quoted companies and they just divide up the CEO's wages between uh, the higher half and the lower half, just amongst those CEOs. And this is shareholder returns, the better paid CEO's companies are doing worse. That's what we're paid. So, you know, it's nonsense to think that it's, it's about performance. I think, I don't think, uh, I'm going to end here, I don't think we can rebuild trade unions to the strength they were, particularly with the uh, strength of the, the, of the service sector, small employers, harder to unionize, and so on. I think we've got to bring in some other democratic constraint. Um, I was disappointed in the discussion in the last session talking about freedom and inequality. You know, great inequality used to be an American value in contrast to the class-ridden societies of Europe. Um, but during the, the, the communism, um, you, it became common to think that the cost of inequality, uh, of great inequality, is you lose your freedom. That's what the experience of those regimes seem to tell us. You lose your freedom of speech. You have a police state. That's the only way of getting greater equality. So who wants greater equality? I certainly don't. But actually, you can do it by extending democracy into the workplace, not by limiting it. Our long-term objective must be an extension of democracy. You know, we should certainly do some redistribution and OECD are taking steps uh, to get tax havens to provide information to, uh, um, to 
tax authorities, partly worry about loss of revenue to governments, but also concerned with money laundering for terrorism, so they want to know where all this money is going. Um, but you see, to rely just on free distribution through taxes and benefits, that can be undone at the stroke of a pen by the next president or prime minister who doesn't like it. We've got to find ways of building great equality much more fundamentally into our social structures. And I think that it's, it's in the work that these inequalities have created. We've lost social cohesion in our neighbourhoods. But where we have most to do with each other is at work. And yet it's at work where we're most divided by hierarchy, line management and so on. People say that uh, an employee buyout of a company turns a company from being a piece of property into a community. Suddenly managers are answerable to the body of employees. Uh, and, you know, the problems of democracy, at least in the workplace, you all know what's been going on in the last year. You all know why that cock-up happened um, and who was responsible and how to deal with it. So it's at that sort of level that we can be most effective in democratic uh, work. And there's uh, studies coming from the Harvard Business School saying that more democratic companies perform better in terms of productivity and so on. So I think, you know, our long-term objective for human emancipation <coughs> should be thinking about the democratization of our economies. Um, and one of the things I was reading coming out here is that The Economist has a, a sort of six-page supplement on uh, the scale of these major industries, even bigger than they used to be, corporations running rings around national governments, pushing um, corporation tax down and so on. Uh, we must find ways of dealing with all that before we can create a decent society, a sustainable society with higher levels of well-being. But remember, we've got to the end of what we can do in improving well-being by raising everyone's standards. We have to do it now by improving the quality of the social environment. And the exciting thing is we can do that by reducing the income differences between us. So we're not caught up endlessly with seeing people in these terms of superiority and inferiority and worries about how we're judged in those terms. Thank you. I shall stop there. Um, uh, only that there's more political polarisation with inequality. Um, you are aware of that. It's happening. It's been happening in the States for a long time. Paul Krugman drew attention to it in his conscience of the liberal. There's several studies of it, it's happening everything. Inequality leads to more political conflict, leads to political polarization, dysfunctional government. So thank you.
Computer Security Organization, not the name. Um, and there was a prestigious outside economist who came to speak um, on this day, and it was on Professor Wilkinson's work. And then, and since then, never to, to this day have I heard such vitriol in a formal academic presentation. Um, most of you probably came here for, because you love this work, um, but there are, it's not just that people disagree, it's it makes them mad. Um, I have seen them make this mad. This, um, this person, it stuck in my head, said uh, that this early work was the best news for socialists since Lenin got off the train at the Finland station. Um, <laughs> compared to the study of crop circles, um, and it just piled on more personal invective, uh, invective that was directed at Professor Wilkinson. And I said to myself, if it makes anybody this mad, there has to be something to it. So I went and read it, and in fact, there is an enormous amount to it. Um, uh, and uh, I, I think it's great. But my role today is to mix things up a little bit and try to talk about different perspectives, different ways of thinking about it. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I've got three or four questions that I will post to Richard. Um, and um, if people want to riff off them in the audience, if it's something that's germane to what I'm asking, and similar to an idea that you have, please sort of jump in and follow up, and we can have sort of a multi-stage conversation. And after I've exhausted that and kind of gotten to the three or four things that I'd like to stimulate, we'll open it up to the full audience. And we have a fair bit of time, so I think we can do that. Um, you know, so in your book, you say, at an intuitive level, People have always recognized that inequality is socially corrosive to society. Now, I'm trained as a political theorist. In the history of political thought, I just have to say that it's emphatically false. Um, not that it shouldn't be the case that it shouldn't just bother people. It does not say um, some people. Well, it does, it, it does not say some people. It does not say some people. Um, uh, and, and really, it's quite recent that our intuitions have come this way. And most thinkers, in his history, I would say, argue or intuit that false or for forced equality is what's socially corrosive, rather than um, uh, inequality. Now, how far back exactly, um, you know, I, I don't know, but I think it might have something to do with people's place in, in the world. And I was interested in how far back your evidence goes. I'm assuming it's roughly with the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, probably even more recent for some of these sorts of uh, connections. And I would add that that notion of equality was especially it was especially not true with respect to material equality. So if we think about the American founding, the idea of equality before the law, yes, that was very prevalent. But the idea of material equality, the fact you know, I've been teaching the federal papers lately, the idea of material equality was not um, something that was sought out. So I guess I'm asking you to sort of reflect a little bit, to think a little bit about why you make the claim about the, the intuition at one level. Intuitions are to me. You've just given us 50 slides of, of uh, hard data on this. But why do you think it is um, that those are people's intuitions and to place your argument in a larger historical context? Does that make sense? Yeah, I suppose I was thinking of um, the French Revolution, liberty, fraternity, and liberty, um, which I think is uh, an extraordinarily perceptive picking out the dimensions of the social environment that are most important. And by liberty, they didn't mean uh, uh, freedom of consumer choice. Uh, they meant uh, not being somebody else's man, not being belonging to somebody, beholden to somebody um, in a sort of feudal relationship or relationship at stake. Um, fraternity, I think they meant something quite close to what we, we mean by social capital. Um, by social cohesion, that sense of helpfulness. Um, uh, I suppose the way also socialists often refer to each other as brother and sister. Uh, that's come up repeatedly in radical news movements, uh, uh, I think for centuries. And equality is the condition under which you get the liberty and fraternity right, not being belonging to somebody, being uh, and the uh, the higher social cohesion, stronger community life, the reciprocity. So I was thinking about that. But, um, you know, the, the um, social evaluative threat experiment I mentioned, uh, the Indian children from different castes, 
suddenly when they know each other's caste, the low caste children suddenly perform so much less well. Uh, shows that these things go on very widely. And, uh, and my brother was in South Africa visiting a few schools and he heard of some kid who uh, apparently um, his parents had died as of AIDS and um, he was being brought up by a grandmother who had some absolutely tiny pension and this kid said he must have some very expensive pair of jeans and she said we can't possibly afford anything like that and he said he'd kill himself if he didn't get them and when my brother asked kids about this what, what's it about they all said it's about respect um, and of course you know you're somebody or you're no one in those kinds of uh, societies um, so you know I, I wouldn't like to point to a stage in history where suddenly these things matter uh, the fact that hunting and gathering societies cover 90 or 95 percent of our existence of human, as human beings I think that uh, they put that huge investment in each other, gift exchange, food sharing and so on, and greater equality, uh, to avoid the issues of uh, dominance and subordination. People suggest that it's partly people trying to maintain their own autonomy. And if you stop being uppity, bossy, selfish, um, if you don't respond to um, jokes and remarks people make about you, you get uh, gradually ostracised. Uh, Christopher Bohm, the um, American uh, um, anthropologist, in his, uh, um, I think the book's called Moral, Moral Origins, he has uh, data on maybe 200 different hunting and gathering societies. Um, really good evidence now of that uh, equality, and when it began to disappear, we were beginning into agriculture. But I think it's, it's always had the same meaning. Um, and you do different historical periods, suddenly see it coming out. Um, I, of course, don't mean that the majority of societies recognize these things. We have a very strong tendency to think the rich are wonderful and the poor are hopeless. Um, and uh, voting patterns show partly a matter of differences in those beliefs, but I maybe I should have said some people. Yes. <laughs> Perhaps I picked up. Uh, um, but I, I, I was partly granting that I think that there has been a swing towards that, that there are strong intuitions that way. But my sense is, um, how, you know, that students, when I teach history of political thought, they're shocked at the sort of casual inequality that's thought to be part of the great chain of being. <coughs> I'm not sorry. going to be tolerable, tolerable, tolerable but uh, to, to be a, a normal feature of society. So, okay, pivoting to um, the, the second thing that I think I want to talk about, I read the preface um, uh, to the book, which is really, the whole book is really wonderful, but the preface is, is beautifully done, uh, especially. And in it, I'm very intrigued. Um, you say, and I have this secret thing of who compliments which, nobody knows which bits we each <laughs> <laughs> uh, Well, I'm going to chalk up for one of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in it, Stating that you thought of calling the book evidence based politics. And this is a riff, some of you in the audience will see the riff. It's a riff off of evidence based medicine, which is a sort of powerful movement um, in medical and public health fields that have come over um, in a long period of time. And that what you were trying to do for politics and policy to a certain extent um, is evidence based politics, which um, uh, I am all for um, and think is great. However, it, it, it set up a, a thought in me, which is that, and taking you very literally here, maybe again more literally than you intended here, that it was supposed to be a title. But if we think about when, when evidence based um, medicine decisions are being made, re recommendations are being made, they actually look at four criteria the balance of desirable and undesirable outcomes, the quality of the evidence, the values and preferences, and the costs or risks. Um, resource utilization and risks associated with that. And so I was trying to think through how the evidence looks in this context. I will just stipulate, as a, I think 
reasonably competent social scientist, this is the best um, evidence that's going um, on these sorts of questions. I have to believe that. I think, and I will talk a little bit more, there is countervailing evidence. There are people out here who, who um, you know, make different arguments and bring up different uh, pieces of data. I will say this, though. In, in the evidence-based medicine context, randomized controlled trials are really the gold standard. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that you need to run randomized controlled trials on whether Sweden or Finland or Peru um, uh, changes, uh, changes their entire social structures, nor could we. But what EBM does is calls carefully to our attention not just our best guess at something given the, the evidence, but, in, but attendance to what we don't know or how confident we are in the data, even if this is the best data we have. So it's already stipulated that I think you have the best set of evidence of anybody going here. But if I were really to try to think this through in terms of the complicated causal steps between macrostructural, fiscal, and, and monetary policy, and how that trickles down into cortisol, cortisol levels and leads to incarceration and these other sorts of things, this is a monumentally complex um, set of, of inferences that we would need to make that I think you would, I don't know if you would agree, but I think you would agree is not, uh, that there are, I am aware, and I've poked around a little bit, that there are no multivariate structural models that attempt to take it from, from way high up all the way down. Um, and the ones that try certain steps are a little bit more rickety than the bivariate um, graphs that, that you showed us here. And so my question is something along these lines. It is, even if I concede that this is the best evidence going, that when we're talking about fundamentally reshaping societies and economies, that issues about um, values and preferences, costs come in, um, and, and, and frankly, sort of a Burkean conservatism, not conservatism in the sense that I like inequality, but being very careful about tinkering uh, in major ways with the fundamental underpinnings of society in the face of good evidence, but what I think, if it were in an EBM context, would be called like a leak recommendation. If there's evidence there, it's maybe your best bet, but be careful. I'm not suggesting that we introduce total equality uh, tomorrow or even over the next uh, 10 years. Uh, our study is entirely empirical and uh, all we can see is that through the range of observations we have from uh, well, the United States down to um, the Scandinavian countries, uh, in that, over that range greater equality seems to be ben beneficial. We don't know what happens if you get more equal than Sweden, uh, but it's not playing with things that are uh, most awful, destructive, potentially lethal outcomes. We know that the Scandinavian societies work very well. Um, and uh, I think that in terms of this, the quality of the evidence, as I said, although we showed us these bivariate things, because we were trying to get a picture that's been coming together in the public health and social epidemiology journals into the public arena. That's why we don't even put numbers on the graphs. We just have high and low. We were advised by a publisher, and they said, actually, you lose 10,000 readers for every equation you have, things like that. But this picture has been coming together since the 1970s. The first papers showing that uh, inequality was associated with more violence and with worse health came out in the 1970s. And then now, I was saying there are two or three hundred papers, because when we reviewed them uh, in 2006, I think we found uh, 160 or 70. But now, um, people are also in public health states, three or four hundred. So there's a huge depth of, of evidence people are looking at. And some manage to find things that try and really seem to make it go, part of the effects go away. I think some of those are um, entirely spurious. I mean, you know, people doing things that are rather like saying, I'm going to see what effect class differences have on the society while controlling everyone, controlling out the effects of everyone's individual class. Um, we're trying to think of. Uh, inequalities 
entirely different from status and class, um, which is uh, explicitly ruled out. But I do think that, I mean, while the students in Tennessee, I was liberated by uh, doing courses with Karl Popper, um, great philosopher of, of science, and uh, so not only the sort of emphasis on testability, um, you know, this theory has been tested many, many times. Um, when we had shown the relationships internationally, or, or that was before I got together with Kate, um, people uh, said at the Harvard, again at the Harvard School, uh, said they'd look at it um, amongst the American states. And clearly they were the same relationships with Harvard amongst the American states. I'm really glad I didn't know while they were doing the work that they were doing it because I had a lot of heebie-jeebies about it. <laughs> but of course, it, actually, the British Medical Journal published studies of the American states and inequality by two different groups, one at Michigan and another at, at Harvard, both showing these relationships. Even the provinces of China, which had bigger inequalities and less healthy. Um, so, I think one should not understate the evidence, but it's not simply that it's been tested at that simple level in the way that people like Popper suggested, but um, the theory leads to lots of novel predictions. Um, when I first worked on the relationship, I didn't have an explanation for why less equal countries appeared more unhealthy. Um, and I began to think maybe it's something to do with the quality of relations because we were just beginning to learn about friendship and stuff being protective. And from qualitative data, um, it looked to me as if uh, um, societies at each end of our thing had different levels of social cohesion. And then researchers actually used measures of trust and showed that relationships exist. Then we start thinking, well, it's about this social evaluative threat, these social anxieties, that's the main source of stress in the population as a well, whole, worries about how we seem to judge. And then that study of the so high levels of social anxiety comes out uh, several years after our book came out. So there has been an extraordinary sense that, you know, the, the little hypotheses we had to generate initially to think, and there must be some explanation of it. The most likely is that maybe this is happening. And then somebody's done a study that shows it is happening. And what Popper said is a way of judging the difference between a good and bad research program, whether that's always explaining away problems, or whether it's making novel predictions which are confirmed. And we've had an extraordinary sense of, as if we were on a really rich seam that we were mining. Um, and um, and of course, you never prove anything is true ultimately, um, again, as Papa said. Um, we did, by the way, uh, write a paper, uh, what we call a causal review, I think it came out last year, uh, published by NIH in a book they produced, uh, I don't know which chapter, uh, but also published in Social Science and Medicine where we go through the possible alternative explanations, reverse causality, um, this kind of thing, and say why we think they don't wash. Okay, great. Um, well, certainly I didn't mean to, uh, to, to say that the body of evidence wasn't a significant body of evidence. It, it certainly is, but it seems to me that, that also that one needs to make a direct case using the sort of um, EBM framework on um, risks, values, and preferences, costs, these other sorts of things. I, I guess I would disagree somewhat on, on the student case in that, or, or at least speak in the voice of somebody who I think could reasonably disagree and say that's precisely the issue, is, is that for all of these countries, there's basically you know, a structural variable that you could throw in on them that makes them unusual as countries. And that it's quite a leap to say that the, that, that there would be the same effect of progressive taxation in the United States as there would be 
um, for smooth, if for nothing else, but let's say our different racial structures, um, things that we've talked about before. And then given that, a certain amount of conservat conservatism um, um, moving forward might be warranted. Um, so let me talk a little bit about, so, uh, about a few of the sort of disconfirming um, uh, things. For example, while crime rates in the United States have dropped dramatically, while the inequality has risen dramatically, same 30 or so year time period, um, there appears to be no correlation between happiness and inequality in the World Value Survey and other sorts of surveys. One might think that that's a pretty darn important indicator that would be centrally implicated um, in your theory. And I, you know, I didn't have to prosecute, um, and I didn't do uh, you know, an anti-review uh, sort of essay, but get you to speak a little bit about, maybe this is the best way to ask, ask the question. What pieces of evidence out there that you're missing, or that seem to contradict you, trouble you the most in forcefully recommending you know, fairly large scale revisions um, in, in societies, in many societies? Um, I have been very bothered about uh, the improvement in uh, several outcomes since the early 90s. Teenage births have gone down, um, and violence uh, has gone down. Um, Martin Daly has a new book out called Killing the Competition, where he has an explanation of that, and he emphasizes, and he's one of the world's great authorities on, on violence, and uh, uh, he talks about inequality as the big driver and has some explanation for, I'm sorry, I, I don't remember what it was, but Killing the Competition just out, Martin Daly um, has something on that. I think he, he thinks that at the bottom, um, uh, wages were, or unemployment, things were improving a bit. Um, I'm not sure. Um, on happiness, there are a number of studies which actually show relationships, I know the ones which don't. Um, I think that in nearly all the measures we use were objective factors, and deaths and numbers of people in prison and things like that. Interestingly, the studies of health which seem to, uh, the recent ones that disagree with us, are studies of self-reported health. Uh, during the last month or three months, has your health been excellent, good, fair, poor, or bad? Um, and uh, people show that that's not related internationally to inequality. Interestingly, those measures um, have a slight inverse correlation with uh, death rates, life expectancy. So. In countries with high life expectancy, people's self-reported health is worse. Uh, and I think part of the um, effect of inequality is that you have to be tough. Um, and I think with a subjective measure like happiness, uh, it means very different things. I rather suspect that if you ask a Japanese person whether happy, they will say, they will feel that to say, yeah, I'm doing great, thanks. Well, that would sound rather bragging. And you should be more modest and say, well, oh, things aren't so bad at the moment, thank you. Um, uh, whereas in America, if you don't say you're happy, maybe it's a rather a commission of favor. Um, Michael Marmot always says that health is a better measure of happiness than questions about happiness. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm not too bothered about some of the studies of happiness that don't show relationships um, for those kinds of reasons. Um, yeah. You asked me what I was most bothered by. Um, one of the things that used to bother me, I can't say that it still does, is people often used to say, look, people can tell themselves with things. And studies of relative deprivation 
always say people compare themselves with people like themselves. Um, and, you know, for me, working on the overall scale of income differences, suddenly all that seems irrelevant. People are just looking at their neighbours. Um, and that seemed a, quite a major problem to me. Uh, so also did the improvements amongst the, uh, in, uh, the effects of inequality on the better off. That was a big problem. But I realised what was going on in the comparing yourself with people like yourself. When I read Sapolsky's, um, he, as well as extraordinarily good scientific work, he wrote a nice book called The Primate's Memoir, talking about his time in East Africa, watching baboons and darting them and taking blood samples before they woke up and so on. And uh, in one place he says, baboon number seven in the hierarchy never fights one, two, and three, he knows he'd lose. He never fights number 14, 15, 16. They know they lose. The number seven fights six and eight. If you're going to lose or gain status, it's your close equals you have to watch. And so, you know, I can get on quite easily with you, and yet if you start doing things, saying things that suggest you think you're better than me, I say, who the hell do you think you are? <laughs> and every country has expressions I'm of that kind. I'm 20. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and so, gradually, and Paul Farrell in his Against Method, uh, rather criticism of Popper, he talks about how a good theory is better than the um, it is, as it were, better, stronger than the facts. The facts are low-level theories. And so, you know, he says that theories are often surrounded by refutations. Endless stuff disagrees with them. But you gradually reinterpret the evidence. And he says that the importance of good theory is that it changes the way we look at the world and understand the world. Um, if it's something that fits in with everything, the way we know the world exactly, then it doesn't really tell us very much. Um, and so uh, uh, I think there has been this process of things that didn't seem to fit. And as to the better off benefit from great equality. Um, you know, there are those real difficulties. Um, so there has been, and also I've been thinking about nothing else for 40 years. There has been this gradual process of you know, learning to what's going on. I remember when I first looked at income different changes in incomes, uh, looking to see if there were changes in death rates. In Britain, we have um, census data on occupational death rates from about 1911. Um, every 10 years, you get a, a new census on occupational death rates. And there's also a survey that gives you incomes in each occupation, also the spread of incomes in each occupation. And so I look to see whether uh, occupations that have moved up, the earnings league, it had improvements in their health, and there was uh, deterioration moved down in the earnings league. And at first, the data didn't fit at all. And I think I was looking at 10 or 20 year changes. And then I realized I was using um, basic incomes. And in the second period, there'd been a huge expansion of uh, overtime bonus and bonus payments. So that's another example of how a good theory leads to overturning what appear to be the facts, which are, in fact, low-level theories. You say to yourself, what on earth is wrong with that survey data? What on earth was the question? What was the exact wording of the question they asked? Mm -hmm. Um, well, how did they do their sampling? They gradually find out. Now, so, with any theory, you find yourself surrounded by problems. There is no way of deciding whether arbitrary to abandon your theory or find out what's wrong with what appear to be the facts. If you just abandon your theory, then your research program is a sort of random walk. You're not going anywhere. Uh, if you have a good theory, then you try and maintain some hard problem. 
So, you know, I might be willing to say, okay, it's not income, or someone shows me that it's really uh, wealth that counts, or something like that. And so maybe I'm willing to accept that amendment to my theory, but as long as I can keep the, its material differences at the bottom, I may say. Um, so, you, there's a sort of defence of the hard core of your, your theory. Of course, you might end up with a theory which um, runs into just endless problems. You're always explaining away difficulties, failures, and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, you should give up the theory. Um, but uh, if it seems to be making successful predictions, then that, that is a real test. Why don't we open the floor to our audience? This is sort of on the uh, I mean, uh, question being said, it used to worry you it doesn't anymore, because I was trying to think this through, and I, I don't think I understood the, how the bad news story uh, was, was helping with the question. Um, so I, I think the worry was sort of, uh, what's going on here uh, uh, with the mechanisms that explain why we get higher stress in circumstances of greater uh, inequality? So the way, I mean, as I was listening to you talk, I was thinking that, you know, that maybe the idea is something like um, uh, if the people with whom I compete um, are more different than me uh, in one society than the people with whom I compete are in a different society, then it would be uh, so more can stressful. You say, can you say that again? So, so, um, so I'm going to imagine sort of how, how sharp the curve is right around me, right? So the person, if I'm seven, yeah. Um, uh, the, uh, if the one who's no, because dominance and subordination are just much more important dimensions to social life. Uh, some um, um, animal behavior people have said that actually you should measure um, dominance by uh, how animals are watching each other. They all look into the dominant individual. Um, so it's not that they are unaware of the dominant animal. Uh, they're scared stiff, stiff of the dominant dominant animal and have to show submission responses, not to meet the eyes and sort of full gaze like this. Um, uh, it's, uh, we know our inferiority and the big house in our village, uh, they wouldn't invite us to supper, I'm sure, but I'd feel awkward inviting them back. Uh, I don't interact with the the much richer people. I don't interact with the much poorer people very much. Um, I interact with people like myself. I choose my friends from my near equals. So why? But it's not because I'm unaware of the top and bottom, and it's not that the fact that there are the super rich and the poor that makes me more worried that how I'm seen and judged uh, makes us all judge each other more by status. So I, mean, I was imagining that the worry was I might slide or uh, or I want to go yes. up, but but if, but if I'm uh, if I'm only going to slide up or down a bit, um, I'm only going to I'm only competing around here. Why does it matter whether the people who, who I'm not in competition with have hundreds of millions of dollars or hundreds of billions of dollars to support? Why does that make me more stressed? And from um, the hood too, it talks about. Uh, how uh, it takes the flat plane, inequality takes the flat plane of human relationships and turns it on edge so people are all desperately trying to cling on. Um, and one of the things in the book we just finished, with this set of manuscripts we published the other day, I found it very difficult to try and write a few paragraphs about can we really imagine what a society would be like? If we weren't so that we weren't so completely imbued with this idea of hierarchy, um, I I talked about the hunting and gathering societies, but I then talked about how inequality started with agriculture and um, the class hierarchy, then how different class hierarchies have varied, and there's a, um, a stately home that I visited several times and said it's the best example of the medieval um, uh, 
castle, I think, in, in Britain. But you see, in, in the 15th, 16th centuries, everyone lived, they all, the whole household, people who owned it, plus all the servants, slipped, slept together in a great hall. Um, and that was perfectly ordinary. It was a later century that the owners built a, a division to separate off the quarters. So you see gradually uh, class hierarchy taking on different forms. And in the Victorian period, of course, big houses uh, had a backstairs for the servants. They work in the kitchen in the basement and they live in the attic rooms. And you don't want to pass them on the main stairs in the house. So there's, they're trying to live together with a total separation. And you know, think of that, what that does to your idea of yourself. Either as one of the superior being, beings or one of the, the servants. There is endless ways, um, and all the ideas that, you know, some people, some of them are brilliant, others are just hopeless. Um, endlessly, we talk about uh, if a bright kid, or uh, one of your colleagues is not too bright, a bit dumb, um, so and so. Um, um, you know, our consciousness is imbued with that kind of thing. And the fact that we now regard the social hierarchy as a meritocracy and we judge each other, others' abilities by where we are in it. Most of the causality goes in terms of social hierarchy and ability. It doesn't go from innate ability to position in the social hierarchy. It goes from position in the social hierarchy uh, to those become the determinant of ability. That's much more important um, in terms of causation. But, you know, all these processes affect our perception of ourselves and each other. Um, I, one friend who wasn't uh, equal in sort of social terms and asked him, this building worker, uh, we used to talk a lot and, and drink together. And, uh, he, and he was amazed at the sort of, we were doing research which was discovering things that nobody else ever knew. Um, you know, the idea that there were researchers, even in the local university, doing research that was finding out new things was an astonishing idea to him. Um, but anyway, he used to enjoy these discussions, but he often prelude some of his remarks by saying, you know, Rich, I've only got one brain cell. But I was wondering what you thought about such and such. So he had, and he certainly believed that his social position was because the school had taught him that, that he was stupid. And I've known people who wouldn't go down the street their school was in because they were, it was an experience that had left them phobic about the whole. And as I read in that first uh, uh, quote, um, school being a system of social breaking. And if you think of the stereotype threat experiments, just some little subtle reminder of your status that affects your performance. Think of living it, uh, kids in primary schools and so on, and how it's going to affect their performance. And we know the prejudices of teachers affect marking. Poor kids do much better if they're marked by somebody exterior to the school who doesn't know them. Ethnic differences as well are reduced if they're Okay. You began showing a very clear relationship between income or lack thereof and poor health and all kinds of other poor outcomes. When we get to the wealthier countries that you concentrated on, as they get more unequal, are the poor people simply absolutely more poor? Is that, the, is that a mechanism that's going on so much so that if you get into, say, big U.S. cities, that the poverty level looks closer to where you started in the third world, and that maybe one of the things going on is just in some of these unequal, wealthier countries, the mean income is high. But I'm wondering if you control in the studies well, for the absolute yeah. income across these highly unequal societies. People have done much more than that. I showed you a, a, a forest plot of multi-level modeling. But in multi-level models, you don't just control for the proportion in poverty or the average 
or median income of the population, uh, you control for everyone's individual income or education. Um, so we say, okay, what would be the death rate of people in this room over the next 20 years uh, that we would predict by knowledge of your individual incomes? And it, we might have the same average income in a society where people were bunched quite close to the mean, or equal society, uh, and the same mean as a society where people were very different ends. So, we control for your individual incomes and the relationship that we predict about your death rates, and then see if there's an extra contextual effect of whether uh, you live in a more or less uh, equal society, depending on you know, what the dispersion of incomes is in that society. And so even after you've taken account of the individual uh, factors, as I say, education or income are the usual, are the usual ones, uh, you find that there's an additional contextual effect of uh, inequality. Um, so, given your, <coughs> your education, you living on your job, if you live, moved into a more equal society, you might live a little bit longer um, and you'd be less likely to be a victim of violence, your children might be less likely to become uh, seriously addicted to drugs, uh, that kind of benefit. Um, even if your own individual income and job and so on didn't change. Um, could you take us back to the economic democracy um, to the level of um, So, I... I think, so, yeah, so, I... Um, I can't remember what it says, and I'm a slow reader. <laughs> Uh, gradually out of profits and then I can use that same money to uh, 
help other firms through the same change. But in, in Britain, where car produce and employee ownership isn't uh, very advanced, um, it's been increasing about 9% a year for the last few years, and it's reckoned by, I think it was 2020, to be 10% of the economy. Um, and I do think there are enormous benefits in that. And I don't know which forms work best, I think we've got to really pursue them all and see which does work best. Um, In what? In Sweden. Uh, I don't know. There are lots in Italy, and of course, there's the famous Mondragon example in Spain, said to be the most dynamic part of the Spanish economy, employing about 80,000 people. One of our better supermarkets, well, it's not a food supermarket, um, John Lewis. It, it sells all sorts of household goods, it has about 70 or 80,000 employees, they're all partners, um, and Profits are redistributed to all employees, so they at Christmas get another one or two months pay instead of going to a bonus for a few people at the top. Uh, and there, there are structures of participation and so on. And there are lots of different structures, I and mean, you might just elect the director, and you might have to seek re election, or um, you know, I don't know what the best form is. I was once going to do a research project comparing 10 employee owned companies with 10 others. I was going to match them by size and sector um, and interview employees. Um, I spent about a year putting together a really good research project and a good group of people. And the research council rejected it. So. Yeah, it still needs doing. Um, so, I'm, I'm totally convinced that your theory picks out a really important structural systemic object. Um, and, and I suppose the question that occurs, and maybe we're dancing around it, is that, you know, if we, if we accept that, that systemic effect, what are the points of leverage or, if you want, points of vulnerability in that systemic effect? So, do you have a sense of the policies that are that? Uh, most drive the increase of inequality, or conversely, what sorts of policies would, would effectively uh, reverse that dynamic? I think that uh, another study is looking for drivers. It started with economists who only measured what was measurable, and ideological shifts were beyond them. Um, whereas I think actually politics is, is the big driver. Um, rather than as Paul Krugman suggests. Um, and uh, I do think it's the first the strengthening of the labor movement and then the decline. I think also the fear of communism um, probably was good for capitalism. Uh, another thing that points in the same direction, the World Bank produced a report called, I think it was called the East Asian Miracle, in the mid-1990s on the, what we used to call the Asian tiger economies that were growing so fast. And they all reduced their income differences between about 1960 and sometime in the 1980s. They have a chapter on why they did it. And they said that in each case it was because um, the governments faced um, crises of legitimacy, by which they meant for instance, South Korea <coughs> faced North Korea and needed to obtain the loyalty of the population. Uh, 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 Taiwan faced mainland China, Hong Kong faced mainland China, the Philippines had guerrilla forces operating. So in each case, they go into the policies of Japan, they called shared growth, um, deliberately to, grind, to gain the and cooperation of the population. In both world wars, Britain does it too. Um, and Titmus in his um, book, War and Social Policy, says that to gain participation in the war effort, the government realized that the social hierarchy had to be reduced. Um, and so they, you know, they had 
uh, food rationing, um, uh, taxes on um, luxuries, subsidies on necessities, um, and a lot more redistribution of income. Um, and even Bismarck, who produced the earliest unemployment insurance and things like that, did it to gain support for his project of unifying the German states. So I do think the evidence suggests that um, countries narrow, governments narrow into differences when they have to. It's interesting that we've been going through cuts, partly as a result of the financial crash. Um, and, you know, just the other day, there was some debate about whether, I can't remember, I think Belgium could afford better health services um, or whether they needed to wait for more economic growth. In Britain, we introduced health services with huge crippling levels of national debt immediately after the war. And so, you know, governments don't do it when they're rich enough to, they do it when they have to. <laughs> and, uh, and even Roosevelt in the 1930s, when that downward movement from the New Deal and so on, downward movement in equality, I think he talks about redistribution, no, reform in order to preserve. And I'm sure that, I, I'm not really a historian, but I'm sure people in the 1930s of the Great Depression and so on, must have thought this is the collapse of capitalism that Marxism always predicted. And given the sort of expansion of communism, I bet there was real fear of that. And so again, the attempt to gain um, popularity and, and so on, redistribution. So I think we need a, a massive social movement. I think that we're being helped by OECD, which is taking action on tax havens. You can't raise top take tax rates by very much, um, while the rich can hide their money away so easily. The difficulties are absolutely appalling because of the, these are, um, arrangements have got so frantically complicated and they can run rings around the sort of uh, tax authorities in each country. Uh, but um, a Labour Chancellor um, before the Blair period um, said that he, he came close to uh, saying that any financial arrangements which seem to be set up for the purposes of tax avoidance would be ignored. So although you set up this complicated system of trusts and things in other countries, we're not going to take a blind bit of notice of it because we think you did it simply to avoid tax. Um, and that seems to be a very neat way of getting around people finding endless new loopholes and having to block them and, and so on. But I do think that more important is to reduce the income differences before tax. That has been where the biggest increases in inequality have come from. The bonus culture and so on that spread down, started in the private sector, is beginning to spread into the public sector. Um, and uh, I, I, I know a few people at the top who are saying I'm not going to take my bonus this year, um, showing some sensitivity to public feeling. Um, I think we've got to make them more worried. Um, so, actually, I think that's a wonderful make uh, them more worried. <laughs> that's a wonderful place to stop. I hope you all will join me and thank you.